Well, good morning and welcome to Northeast. Why don't you stand up with us as we get started together? daughter Emily and she is here today to make a decision in front of you all uh, to be baptized and um, <laughs> she's pretty special to us so um, I'm just at a loss for words right now but Emily it's been it's been a long 12 years praying for you and yet it also seems like it was just yesterday that you were born and here we are I'm very proud of you and excited to be here in this moment. Emily, I'm going to ask, because of the conversations that we've had, that if you believe in Jesus, that you would share your faith in front of these people. You'd repeat after me, okay? I believe, I believe that, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. I, accept him I accept him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior.
Amen. Well, again, welcome to Northeast. We're glad you joined us. Why don't you turn around and say hi to someone near you? continue to sing together this morning. This morning we are continuing in our series called I Love My Church, and this morning we're talking very specifically about worship and uh, how it relates to song and the music that we play. And uh, So this morning is going to look just a little bit different, and I, I know that everybody loves change, and so we're just going to be okay with that. Um, but this morning, uh, as Seth talks about some of those uh, things, you'll kind of hear a little bit of some of those insights and, and biblically about why we do what we do. and especially when it comes to song. And this next song that we're going to sing is one that uh, probably most of us have done. I know we've done it here uh, a few times in the past. I want to give you a little bit of a background uh, to this song. This song is called The Heart of Worship. is written by a guy named Matt Redman. And uh, this song was actually written, uh, there was a time in uh, Matt Redman's church where uh, there was a lot of uh, fighting and quarreling over style of music and which type of style of music are we going to play and, and this one's better than that one. And I know that stuff doesn't happen in today's church, um, and so it's, it's not something we have to really think about as much. 
But uh, it, it was one of those things that um, really was a problem where people seemed to be losing focus on what was most important. Uh, and during that whole time, the senior minister of that church had just kind of said, okay, uh, until we can figure this out, we're done with instruments, period. Uh, and so they went for a time of just doing a cappella music. Uh, and during that whole thing, uh, Matt had done a lot of prayer and study and, and penned the words to this song uh, because it's really getting back to what truly matters when we sing songs and when we come to uh, this idea of worship. And he wrote the words, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I will bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you've required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. And I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. And one of those things I think that we can kind of get wrapped up in sometimes is, man, I, I really like this style or I prefer this type or whatever, but it's all worship. And it's all about God. It's not always about us. And, and I know we have that. I was like, I, I, I lead and I have preferences. But when we, when we take all of those things away, the reality, and we talked about that last week, why do we come here? Because we're all about Jesus. It's all about making him famous and making his name known and giving him the glory that he rightfully deserves. And so as we continue to sing this morning, as Seth uh, comes to speak about uh, worship and song, uh, may it be something that, that you open your hearts and your mind to what God wants to teach you this morning. Let's sing together. When the music fades, it's all is stripped away, and I simply Just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. Cause I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper with me. Coming back. 
Father everlasting, the all creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, So last week we spoke about baptism, and in previous years when I was searching for the reason why Jesus was baptized, I found a beautiful explanation, and it's found in the uh, Jewish wedding tradition. So they didn't date, mainly they were arranged marriages, and the bridegroom would bring a contract, or they call it a covenant, detailing what he had to offer to the, um, 
as a husband to the bride. And he also brought along with that a bride price, what he uh, would pay the bride's father. If the bride agreed, both the bride and the bridegroom would do a ritual cleansing, and then they'd seal the agreement by drinking a glass of wine, which was a toast to the bride and also the bride's willingness to enter into the agreement. They would eat a meal, and then the bridegroom would leave for a period of time and go make a uh, bridal chamber for their honeymoon, and it could take up to a year for him to do that. When all that was completed, he would come and get his bride, usually at nighttime, because there was tradition at that time that the bride liked to be stolen away. So these series of events beautifully, I think, explains how Jesus thinks of us, and it puts a lot of his parables together, if you understand them all. So the covenant we find in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34, God says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make to the house of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will man teach his neighbor or a man a or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So we agree to this when we turn from sin towards God. And then we have a ritual washing. Jesus was baptized, for one reason, as a sign that he was entering into this marriage with us, and we are baptized when we want the new life presented to us. And a cup of wine to seal the contract the cup of wine that Jesus spoke about at the Last Supper and represents the cup that we partake of today in remembrance of that and of his sacrifice. And the bride price we see in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And then he leaves. John 14 through 1, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you there to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And we hope for, and he promises he will come back. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, it says, for you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Remember, the bride liked to be stolen. And also in uh, Matthew uh, 25, it's the parable of the ten virgins. And we know that if you're waiting for him, he'll come at night and you can go into the uh, bridal feast with him or the wedding feast. So Jesus is our bridegroom. He paid the highest price and he's making a place for us now for us to be with him forever. And he will come back for us. Today, let's remember the contract and the price he paid, and it's all because he loves us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have provided a way for us through Jesus. You paid the greatest price, the price that you demanded. We are thankful for that, his sacrifice for us. We love you, and we're faithfully awaiting, Father. All praise and glory is yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
a couple things to share with you before we jump into the message today. First, a change for a dollar story, very, very similar to the one last week. Uh, we stay in touch with CMU, Colorado Mesa University, and as they have students that are coming back and moving back in, oftentimes in the fall, they are well aware of some situations. So, uh, as I mentioned last week, we helped a single mom with some uh, medical expenses and that sort of thing. This week, helped with some groceries. And uh, know that that is an encouragement to both of those different ladies and their kids. And so I hope it's an encouragement to you as well. Um, if you've not picked up on this, the last few weeks we've been talking about raising money on a special offering on October 1st. And I've talked a little bit about that. And uh, there's a video on our website if you'd like to take a look. But what I want to clarify is this. Um, not, I, I recognize, we recognize, I hope you recognize, not everyone can give the same. Some can give more, some can give less. What we're asking is that you would pray about it, look at your finances, and consider giving uh, as much as you can on October 1st. And where your comfort level is with that, that is, that is strictly between you and God. But I just want to clarify that. Um, Mystery Masquerade for the youth group is coming up in a few weeks. There are some handouts out at the Welcome Center for those of you who have uh, teenagers, 6th through 12th grade, or if they've got friends and want to hand some of those out. It's coming up quick. I know that there's still a few spots left to help, probably. Is that true? Or you got them all covered? Pretty good. If you want to come and help out, I'm sure you would not be turned away, as long as it's to come and help and not just come and have fun. Uh, there is a Fall Fest meeting right after service today. It's a planning meeting. That is Saturday, October 28th. It's an afternoon event. If you'd love to be a part of that, it's a, a church-wide, community-driven fun time of food and a lot of different things in the gym and outside in the front parking lot. We need a lot of people to help make that a success. Last week, if you were here, you know that we kicked off a series called I Love My Church. And again, the premise of that is we, we think everybody, whether you attend here or you're just visiting and attend somewhere else, we, we feel like everybody should be able to say, I love my church. That's not always the case. But over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about, well, last, sorry, last week and the next three weeks, going to be talking about four different things that we do when we get together, why we do them. So last week we talked about baptism. Today we're going to be talking about worship, about song. But before I get into that, I do want to share with you what happened last week. After second service, uh, six different people made the decision to be baptized. So, um, yes. Erica Thompson up on the top left, Tyler Hawkins in the top middle, Noah Butzin in the top right, Ethan Tebow, bottom left, Anne-Marie Klein, uh, baptized by her husband Jeremiah, in fact, and then Dominic Kitts down here on the right. What was exciting to me was, was actually two different details. One, I had people ask, well, how many of those did you know about? Uh, not a single one. Um, <laughs> They were all spontaneous, which is extremely encouraging for me. Um, I know that God is, is doing some amazing things here. Second of all, they, they all came from different backgrounds. I, mean, I don't think any single story was exactly the same, but each of their scenarios was different. But during the course of the message, in fact, I will say, I don't think any of the six of them woke up last Sunday planning on making that decision last week. But before they left here, that's, that's what they did, and it's it, exciting. I'm aware, um, obviously you saw my daughter just now, but I'm aware of uh, three other people that are going to be making that decision very, very soon. I think it's really fitting that we're in this series. I love my church. I get excited when I see God moving in people and then making this decision or other decisions in life to get things right between them and God or, or in a relationship that they have here on this earth. I love my church and I love seeing what God is doing here. I, I hope that this and decisions made never, never gets old. We're in week two today. We're going to be talking about worship, specifically music and singing. And I think it's appropriate to just say something. We all are wired differently, are we not? I mean, some of you may have woken up this morning and gotten ready and gotten in your car and made your way here and you're here early and you're ready to go and there's a countdown clock and you're watching that and when it hits zero, you're ready to go. You're ready to sing. You're ready to, to belt out what God has given you. You're excited to be here. There are others of you, perhaps, that um, maybe the thought of singing, and specifically singing where other people can hear you, or singing in public, or singing in any form or fashion, is one of the most terrifying things that you can imagine. What I want you to know is singing together as a church is an important part of who you are personally, as well as who we are as a church. 
Now, before we get into this, I feel like I need to share a little bit about my uh, musical background, which is very, very limited. However, uh, my mother tried her best when I was a youngster to teach me piano, and so I, as I recall, I probably tried to learn that for a year, maybe a little bit longer, and then it was like, no more, Mom, I'm not going to play the piano, not my thing. Now, for those of you young people in the room, not a day goes by of my adult life that I don't regret that decision. So, Mom, if you hear this later, um, there, there you go. Um, I do. I regret not sticking with that. But, you know, in grade school, I sang in the school choirs and um, sang in the church programs and part of the, you know, the Easter and the Christmas programs and those sorts of things. I started playing the drums. I say drums, plural, but it was drum, the snare drum in uh, middle school and with the orchestra and that sort of thing and then moved to the marching snare up in high school. I tried to figure that thing out, but I just could not get the hand, foot, mind coordination all down. So Chris, um, others of you in the room, early, others of you in the room, Aaron, I, sh I should stop. Austin too, I think, right? Yeah. You drummer guys, I, I just can't get the, the hand, foot thing down. But either way, I love music. I do. Um, how many of you know the name Carmen? Yeah, that dates all of us. Uh, Petra, rock band. There we go, a few more hands, all right. Listen to Carmen and Petra and DC talk, and please don't hold any of that against me. But uh, I grew up in the church and grew up listening to music and love music, just probably not my gifting. And so there's a reason that you rarely hear me uh, sing and rarely uh, see me in any type of musical environment. I know what I do well, and I know what I don't do well. But here's the thing. Every week when we get together as a church, about a third of our time is spent singing together. About a third of our gathering time is, is spent singing. So why do we do that? I mean, I recognize a very low percentage of us, and I'm not, I hope I don't offend anyone here, but a very low percentage of us would probably consider yourselves uh, semi-professional singers, right? A very low percentage. Now, very few of you would be thrilled about auditioning for a show on TV like The Voice or, or one of these other reality shows, the American Idol, when it was still on. I know we've got some good singers in the room. I've sat near you. I've heard you sing. I know we have some very, very good singers in the room, but the majority of us, this, this may feel a little bit foreign. We come and maybe we enjoy it and we enjoy listening to it, but maybe it's a little foreign to us, and yet here we are week after week singing songs together. And then we have, you know, Chris and Joey and Chris and, and whoever else may be kind of leading things, and they're occasionally encouraging you to maybe, you know, sing it out just a little bit, or maybe raise your hands or clap your hands, or let's lift up the name of the Lord together, maybe a little bit more subtle, hey, we'd like to invite you this next song to, to join with us. However it is, they're encouraging you to sing along. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, yeah, those of you who sing on stage, it's not a big deal. I mean, you guys have great voices, and, and you guys can do all of that. Why would I try and com compete with that? I don't care how many times you ask me to sing, I'm not going to do it. In fact, for some of us, maybe the main stage is in the shower, right? Anyone want to be honest? Do you sing in the shower or maybe driving the car down the road? I only sing in the shower when the house is empty, but uh, maybe driving the car down the road. Ah, I'm not going to go there. Ah, why not? Some of you have probably belted out, uh, let it go, let it go, I can't hold it back. In. Yeah, in the shower. Um, any of you parents that have young children at home have heard your fair share of Disney songs and would rather get those songs out of your mind, but we'll get to that later. Outside of singing in private, most of us would not consider ourselves great singers, people that enjoy singing in public, that sort of thing. So why then do you keep asking us, why then do you keep asking me to sing out in church together? Can't we just come and listen? Can't we just enjoy and maybe meditate and, I mean, kind of like a concert. I mean, we go to concerts, what's the big deal? Why can't we come to church and just listen to it as a concert? Friends, we will never do that. We are always going to encourage you to sing. We're always going to encourage you to get involved in singing. There's something so much greater, so much more powerful when we sing together. Something so much more significant than just a concert spectator, in fact, I'm getting ahead of myself, experience could ever, could ever give us. So I want to talk about this thing today, about how singing 
is mentioned time and time again in Scripture, and it's, it's a key part of our expression of worship to God. So for today's purposes, we're going to look at, at, uh, at three things in just a moment. But first of all, we are all natural worshipers. We are all natural worshipers. I hope you, I hope you realize that about yourself. You were created to worship. You were created to worship something. Someone, in fact. Psalm, uh, psalm chapter 150, verse 6, the very last psalm in the Bible says this, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So when we talk about this topic, about everything that has breath, praise the Lord, that we're all natural worshipers, first of all, we need to adopt a, a good theological position on this. Because most of the time, when you hear, hear worship, you assume music. When we talk about worship, you probably think music. So we may say we have a worship leader, and all of a sudden everyone thinks music. So I get some pushback from time to time, hey, you know, music leader, that sort of thing. Music is a powerful tool to use. It, it helps us lift up our worship to God. But worship happens our entire life. It's not just when we come here and sing. We are never not worshiping, in fact. Our affections, our attention, our efforts, our energy, our emphasis is always drawn towards something or someone. The word worship comes from the word proskuneo. It means to give reverence or worth to something or someone. It literally means to give worth-ship, to give something worth. And God built into us, each and every one of us, this innate, inescapable desire to worship. His desire is that we would turn our worship towards Him. But many people in our world today have, have forgotten God, have focused their worship elsewhere. They're still worshiping, but they're not worshiping God. Instead, sometimes our worship is turned towards other things. Maybe for you, maybe there's a little bit in you that kind of worships your work. Maybe that's what drives you. Maybe for you, it's your favorite rock band. Maybe for some of you, it's your, it's your favorite athlete, or, or it might even be maybe, maybe your favorite sports team. I mean, it, it could be. Um, it's game day today, right? I apologize for that. Um, first service, I just kind of tucked up my shirt, and they're like, no, no, no. You need, yeah. I'm like, well, maybe. Maybe we'll see. It could be a dream home. It could be a, a new car that you're putting everything about you and all your efforts into getting. It could be the latest iPhone. Does anybody have one of the new iPhones on order that just came out this week? No. I'm so proud of you. Good job. Stick into your budget, that sort of thing. All right. Maybe it's a mountain bike. I mean, if I'm, I try and be honest, if I'm going to be honest with you, uh, I, I always try to be honest with you. I have a, um, I have about a three-year-old Yeti SB95 model. It's got 29-inch wheels and hydraulic disc brakes, and it's full suspension, and it's pretty light. It's aluminum. It's not the carbon fiber model. I couldn't afford that one. And I bought it used, but it still costs twice as much as my first car. And, you know, I can climb hills and barrel down hills as well, and, and it's amazing. But did you know that Specialized now has a, a newer bike that's better and lighter? And I'm sure I could climb faster and fall harder. And uh, <laughs> my wife a few years ago got me a T-shirt that says, I love my wife. But then in between it, it says, when, I love when my wife lets me go mountain biking. That's what it says. I could go to a bike store and I could stand there for, for too long of a period of time looking at the different models and things and trying to decide what my checkbook would allow me to get. The point is this, we are all natural worshipers. It could be a sport, it could be a hobby, it could be, it could be stuff, it could be money. Everyone worships. It's just a matter of, of what and when. Now, as I talk about that, does that mean that we should feel guilty about owning nice things or enjoying nice things? Of course not. But we know there's a difference between owning and using things and things owning and using us, right? Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1 says this, Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves. Do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I'm the Lord your God. That commandment, God gave that commandment because he knew that we had the capability of turning our affection and attention to things other than him. Worship is a God-given response that he's built into each and every one of us. We are worshipers. 
So how about singing? How does that fit in? How about the singing we do each and every week here at Northeast Christian? Why do we do it? It's an important question to ask because, again, we spend a, a large portion of our time together doing that. Now, we may not be motivated to sing at times. We might miss out on some of God's blessings for us. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Three key truths that Scripture gives us about singing and worship. The first one is this. God invites us to sing. God invites us to sing. Have you ever wondered about how many verses in Scripture reference singing or talk about singing? Any idea? There are over 400 verses in the Bible that reference singing. Almost 50 of those are direct commands to sing. It's something we're instructed to do, something we're invited to do, because God alone is worthy of our praise. Psalm 96, uh, 1 through 4, says this, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name, proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. I mean, you may notice in that passage, it doesn't say, try and sing. Sing if you feel like it. Sing if you've got a great voice and God would enjoy your singing and other people around you would enjoy your singing. No, it doesn't do that. It simply says, sing. It simply instructs us commands us, invites us to sing. Singing expresses our thanks and gratitude to God. We give our worship to God. We express our thanks and gratitude to Him. We do that. We sing to Him first and foremost because He's worthy of it. God is worthy of our praise. Here's number two this morning, second truth about singing. Singing helps us to focus and not forget. Helps us to focus our minds, our hearts, and to not forget. Now, forget what, you might ask. Psalm 103, verse 2 says this. Praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not all his benefits. This is an idea, in fact. David wrote this in the Psalms. I think he did so because he realized he was capable of forgetting things. Oftentimes, we forget things, and you've probably got, if you're a busy person, you probably have some tool or resource you use, whether it's a planner or a smartphone or email or whatever it may be. We are prone to forget things. Singing, David would tell us, is one way that can help us remember certain things about God. Remember his blessings. Here's an instance. David is actively reminding us, hey, remember God's blessings. Remember the good things that he does for you. Remember God's faithfulness. Time and time again, we see this in Scripture. Here's just a few examples. When the Israelites had come out of Egypt after 400 years of captivity, and they've crossed the Red Sea, the parted Red Sea, Moses is leading the way, they get to the other side, the very first thing they do is to sing praises to God, to give Him thanks, to be grateful for His deliverance. In the New Testament, a quick example, Acts chapter 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're in jail. And in the middle of the night, they decide to sing praises to God. Well, we know what happens as that night unfolds. I mean, in the middle of the night, they're singing praises. The Bible says the earth shook. Prison doors are opened. The prisoners' chains are loosed. It says Paul and Silas are actually able to lead the jailer to Christ. An incredible night from singing. Have you ever gotten a song stuck in your head? I mean... It could be, you, you could be anywhere. You could be driving down the road. You could be watching TV. You could be at work. You could be with your family or, or alone on a mountaintop. And all of a sudden, a song gets stuck in your head. And for what, whatever reason, it's just playing over and over and over again. Maybe it's uh, the, the latest song on the radio that you've heard. Maybe for you country fans, it involves a, a long winding road and a lot of crying and a broken down pickup truck. And, uh, Sorry. Little, not much, but a little bit. Um, maybe for you men in the room, it's you know, a classic rock tune or something from your, your younger years. And maybe you don't remember where you first heard it. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a song that you, you love and are, are thrilled that it's there. On the flip side, we all know there's songs that kind of come along as well that are just stuck in our head that we wish we could forget. Again, parents, Disney movies, need I say more. But think about this. How do we oftentimes teach young children how to remember things? What do we do? We put music and melody to something that we want them to remember, don't we? So young kids, we teach them their ABCs by, by putting a song to it, you know? 
A couple times a year, Kids of the Kingdom will have a program in this very room. And as they're practicing for that, and as the night comes for their either graduation in the spring or uh, their Christmas program in the winter time, I am reminded of the songs that Kids of the Kingdom sings as a group so that their children learn things about who God is and learns things about you know, honoring the parents and loving one another. We use song to help people remember certain things. Music is a powerful way to pull at our emotions and remain in our memory for a very long time. And because of this, music is a powerful and effective way to get God's word into our hearts, into our heads. C.J. Mahaney calls singing in church, this is what he calls it, he says it's take-home theology. Take-home theology, because the best songs we sing together and, and sing together, that they kind of serve as a brief, easy-to-memorize means of taking that home. I mean, we remember the biblical truths or biblical summaries that we may sing in a song. They kind of stick with us throughout the week. And so it's important that we, that we remember this. Um, we have a couple different filters here at the church. As Chris is kind of picking songs, one of the filters I'm well aware of because he shared that with me is he's picking songs that we would sing together that, that are true to God's word. Did you know there are songs out there that, that aren't really biblical? Did you know that? I mean, just in the past few weeks, I've been reminded, not here, but there are songs that people sing together as, as a church or as Christians that are they're just not biblical. And so one of the things Chris does is to pick songs that are true to Scripture. That way you can be confident that when you come here to church, when you leave here, when things are stuck in your head throughout the week, whether you're at work or driving, that sort of thing, that it's true to Scripture. Number three. Singing unifies us as a church. Singing unifies us, brings us together as a church. The Apostle Paul talks about this, Colossians chapter 3. He says this in verse 16, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Another idea for encourage. So as you teach and encourage one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I mean, the act of singing together in worship is something that the church has been doing for almost, you know, a few thousand years. A long time. This isn't just something that we started 30, 40, 50 years ago. The church has been singing together as a body for a long time to unify the church. Now, I love that here at Northeast, we have people that come here from all different walks of life. Different generations, different professions, different personalities. The list goes on and on, and it's awesome that we have so many people that are coming together and uniting together in song as we sing together. We believe, as a church, as a leadership, we believe that singing these songs together, when we do that as a church, it unifies us in putting our focus on Jesus. I told you a few last Sunday that this whole series is about kind of pulling back the curtain, peeling back the layers of what we do as a church because we want to explain that everything that we do is about putting our focus on Jesus. When we come together, we want you to be focused on Him and what He has done for you. Now this type of unity is something encouraging, not only for those of us who have been a part of church for a long time, but people that are visiting as well. It helps us to shine a bright light when people come and they see, wow, this, this is a friendly place. They're singing praises to the Lord. Psalm 105, verse 1 says this, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim His name, make known among the nations what He's done. We believe in this type of unity so much that it's not just limited to here on Sunday morning. Our children's ministry, they are singing songs together uh, as they get together. Our youth ministry, on occasion, when it's appropriate, they sing a time, of, or they have a time of worship as well to sing together. When we go to camp, Different age groups are singing together. This isn't just limited to here. It's intended for every single generation. Now, that said, I, I, I want to tell you, has anybody ever had the opportunity to go to camp or a Christ in Youth Conference or a youth conference, children's conference, and just spend time hanging out with kids? Anybody? I have to say, I mean, it's nothing against you, okay? Maybe it is a little bit, but I love those opportunities because it, it's inspiring to me to be a part of worship when young people are involved. Because you know something about young people? They don't, they don't really care. <laughs> they just kind of let it go. <laughs> and they let it, let, it, let it all out there. 
And when they're worshiping the Lord, it is, it is a powerful thing to witness and be a part of. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't yet, be thinking about some future opportunity where you can get yourself around some young people. It might just, uh, you know, help you stay young, a little bit young, a little bit longer. It's great to see, though, that the heart of worship, a heart for God, a heart for worshiping Him is, is alive and well in the next generation of our church. I mean, it's clear, along with songs uh, and instruments, we use a lot of other things as well. We use, you know, we've got screens with words on it. We have motion backgrounds and occasional video to inspire us. But you may have mixed feelings about this. I don't really, but uh, I know where I'm at as well. Did you know some churches use lights, motion lights and lasers and, and fog? <laughs> and I know... Um, We've not used that here. It's, it's uh, probably more of a matter of budget and progression than it is anything else, but uh, did I, I'd said that verbally, sorry. Um, uh, but it's using creative arts. It's using other elements to, to kind of create an atmosphere that helps our emotions focus more on, on worshiping God. And just like music and instruments can help with that, those other things, I mean, even as much as dimming the lights can help us kind of stay focused and not worried about other things going on around us. Those can be helpful aids. I want to go off on a tangent here and and just kind of make a disclaimer. Um, If we, segue, if we truly believe that God is the creator, if we truly believe that he is the all-knowing designer and he, he... the maker of all things, that he made us in his image, then is it too far to, to believe truly that, that we as a church ought to be leading the way in being creative with music and things that we do together? I mean, do you, do you catch what I'm saying? So often we kind of are very reactionary. Oh, the, the world is doing this, and so we'll kind of, you know, we'll Christianize that and bring it into the church. We ought to be leading the way. I mean, the world ought to look at the church and say, wow, that is amazing. That, why aren't we doing that out in the world when it comes to creative arts and that sort of thing? Artistic expression, song, anything and everything ought to be on the table, as long as it's ethical, <laughs> when it comes to honoring and, and bringing glory to God's name. I ho- in the realm of music, I hope one day that our church is at a place where we can write and produce our own songs. For our church, for other churches as well. You may know this, but last fall we recorded a Christmas CD. It was not original music. It was, you know, Christmas songs and well-known songs, but it was a great learning experience. We learned about the recording process and copyright and such and kind of how all of that comes together. But I think it was a step in the right direction. Our church has benefited from other churches being creative and sharing and generous with their resources. And I hope our church is at a place one day where we are on the leading edge and cutting edge and being creative and sharing things and resources with other churches for their times of worship as well. All the methods of inspiration we use are important. We all come again from different walks of life and we're all wired differently. So all those things ought to be on the table, but, but don't miss this. The instruments, the lights, the screen, the, you know, whatever we may use doesn't really matter at all by itself. It all has to be utilized in a way that brings praise and worship and glory to the one who is worthy, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who created you and me, the one who put the stars in their place. So I want to encourage you to try in and and join in when we sing together. If you're the type of person that comes and just observes and listens and, and that's it, I want to encourage you, join in. You may not know the song. Try and listen and and catch the tune, catch the chorus, and join in singing the song together. Here's the point. The goal is for these songs and words that we sing to be an overflow of what's going on in our hearts. When we sing together, that's the goal, that it would be an overflow of what God is doing inside of us, in our hearts and minds. Now, here's the reality. When we walk in here on Sunday morning, when we walk in here to our worship services, for some of you, you may have had an incredible week. It may have been a great week at work, great week in the family or you know, with your spouse. It, it may have just been an incredible week and you, know, you and God are, are clicking and, and you're just on cloud nine and you walk in and you're excited and you're ready to sing and praise the Lord and, and man, this is awesome. And for you, you're ready to go. It didn't cost you 
anything. Praise is, is often something that does directly benefit us. You know, I hear a lot, well, you know, I, I just don't like that style. Or I like this. It's okay. Sometimes praise is directly beneficial to us. But did you know there's sometimes that praise and singing and worship, it's going to cost us something. Unfortunately, life happens. And there are some times when, when maybe you've not had a great week and you walk in the door and, and singing is the last thing on your mind. I mean, we know life can be difficult. And coming to church shouldn't be about putting on a fake smile and pretending that life holds no difficulties and that, that everything is great. If there's a place that we should be able to be honest and open and transparent and vulnerable, it should be our church worship services. I'd encourage you, read the Psalms sometime. I mean, all of the Psalms. I love how David doesn't just talk about the good times, but also talks very boldly and bluntly with God. Raw honesty at times, where, where he models not only what it means to celebrate in worship, but also to be honest with God when things are difficult. And so those of you parents in the room, maybe... Maybe it was a struggle to get the kids up and ready this morning or another morning, and so you come to church and you're already wound up. Maybe for some of you, you know, maybe especially you men, somebody cut you off on the road getting here, and you know, worshiping the Lord, singing in song is the last thing on your mind, or at least not the first. Maybe for some of you, you have a spouse who wants a divorce. Maybe you have a rebellious child. Maybe God seems a little bit far away right now and you can't really see his goodness and circumstances scream that he's forgotten you. I understand with the good there's also another side to things and oftentimes, oftentimes, it's difficult to come to church and be ready to worship and sing. The last thing we feel like doing is singing. To praise God in those times, it does require a personal sacrifice. But here's the truth, when we bring a sacrifice of praise, we choose to believe, even though life is not going as we think it should, God is still good and he can still be trusted. When we do that, we're saying, I believe God is good. He can still be trusted. Our faith is deepened. God is honored. Now, I recognize it, it might be easy for some of you to think, yeah, but maybe that's us. Those, of, those that sing on the stage and you know, speak on the stage and that sort of thing, you guys, you must be super spiritual. <laughs> No. Uh, speaking for myself, I'll speak for everybody. No. <laughs> there are times it's difficult. Now, I, I will tell you this. I listen to them rehearse on Thursdays, and I'm usually here on Sunday mornings when they're here. And I can tell you they work hard. They do their very best to try and get their hearts and their minds in the right place, to step out on stage and to be in a place where they can lead from a place of authenticity. It's an honor and a privilege to do so. But everybody up here is still human too. We're still struggling with things as well. None of us is perfect. There are still challenges we face in life too. Earlier this year, a friend of ours in Missouri found out he had cancer and it was going to take his life. And he sought medical care and he, he's, a, he's been a church member for a long time, an elder and and he had elders pray over him and people praying. Tons and tons of people were praying for him. And then just over a month ago, he was gone. And this is a mentor, a friend of mine. He was on a board of uh, the mission work we were a part of in Mexico. A good friend of mine. And there are times it's like, God, I, I know you can intervene. God, I, I know you're capable of of giving life to this situation, and why, God, why not? And there are times when even I come to church and, you know, other things on my mind and life is happening, and the last thing that is on my mind is, is to sing. I mean, can I just say that? Can I just be honest with you? <laughs> but here's what I know. I know this. Sometimes our heart and emotions need to follow the obedience in our actions. Sometimes you need to lead your heart and emotions with obedience first. And so yes, the weeks that I come to church and I haven't completely felt like it when I have come in and or come in and opened my mouth to to sing, which is usually on the front row so no one else can hear. When I've done that, 
and I sing truth in those songs, I'm amazed at how God seems to kind of push the other things away, the noise of life, the realities of situations around me, the stress from my week, challenges I may be facing, they, they just kind of do, they kind of go away for a little bit. My perspective is refreshed. I remember God's goodness. As we sing songs that you know, you, you know the lyrics to, you remember that the joy of the Lord is my strength. He is a rock and a firm foundation. That He is faithful and compassionate and kind. Here's something I know about worship. True worship is what you do regardless of how you feel. True worship is what you do regardless of how you feel. And so here's the takeaway this week. I want to challenge you to move from being a spectator to a participant. To move from being a spectator to a participant. If you're the type of person that, that comes in and, and you're just kind of here, we invite you, I challenge you, to be a participant in our time of singing together, in our time of worshiping in song. I, I want to ask you to kind of stay where you're at, but our, our team is going to come back up on the stage here in just a moment, and we're going to spend a few more minutes singing praises to God in worship. It's going to be real simple. We're not going to, you know, have you, you we're not going to give you a mic or have you sing a special or a solo or anything like that, but I'm just going to ask you, if you're the type of person that just kind of quiet and sticks to yourself, just, would you join in singing today? Don't just listen, but join in. Know this, above all else, God is looking for your honest heart. God is looking for honesty from you. Sometimes to get our hearts in the right place, the best thing that we can do is to open our mouth, to speak, to sing, to pray the truth about God and His Word. When we do that, our hearts will follow. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for the gift of music and instruments and singing that you've created, that you've designed as a powerful tool to worship you. It unifies us as a church, helps us to remember the truth of your word, your faithfulness, your promises. Father, I pray that um, no matter where anyone is today in a season of life, whether they are on a mountaintop and life is good or they are down in a valley and struggling right now, Lord, help them, help them to recognize that you've invited us to sing. And singing can help us remember and focus and that they would join in. Lord, please be with the people around our country that are suffering in natural disasters right now. Father, please be with uh, the situations just circling around the violence that we see around our country and around the world. Father, help us to know uh, how best to help and help the church to be uh, a light during dark times like this. Lord Jesus, come quickly. We do love you, we praise you, we pray these things in the name of your Son, amen. Let's stand and sing together this morning. I hope that you'll join in. Just a wonder, you ain't 
You know, it says in the book of Romans, chapter 8, that there's nothing can stand against our God. Amen. So as we sing this together, I want to hear you sing it nice and loud. Then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand in faith? What can stand in faith? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. Have a very blessed week.